screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rob Adorney. For those of you who don't know me, um, we'd wanted to start a new kind of a, a way to interact with potential code users and learn so people can learn more about the tools that we develop at the INL. So we started this series. Um, I forget what we call it. It's a monthly seminar series for code use, codes, whatever it is. Um, and so this will be essentially the same day of every month in perpetuity now. So we booked the whole first year, the entire month, or entire 2024 is scheduled out. It's available online. If you would like to have one of your codes that you develop featured as part of this series, reach out to me. I'll start resetting the schedule normally in, in, in June of this year. Um, and so we thought it fitting anyway to start this series with the code framework or our multi-physics framework, Moose, um, that we've been developing here for 15 odd years. And so I won't take up too much time here. Um, for those of you that are virtual, you can type your questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring those. We'll probably hold them to the very end and then we'll have just a round table discussion. And those of you in the room, um, raise your hand. I'll let Cody decide whether you have questions during or at the end. During. During at the end, so okay. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to Curdy Perp, Perp, our department manager. Hi everyone, um, I'm happy you're here. So Rob approached me about a month ago to do this and I couldn't think of exactly how I wanted to do it because I knew that we would have a very mixed audience. So there's plenty of people in here that have been around for several years writing these codes. I don't think they want to hear the same old um, presentation that we give all the time on Moose. But I also knew that we would have a few people that I haven't met or some new faces that don't know anything about Moose. So it's a really tricky audience to kind of prepare a talk for. So I think I've hopefully kind of done the best of both worlds here. So I'm going to go over this um, presentation today and it's going to be a little bit of the history of Moose, which I think is there's plenty of kind of comical parts of that. And then towards the end of this, I will actually go through like what Moose is. So you'll get both today. So in case you were wondering if this was going to be another dry, boring presentation, it's not. So um, yeah, here we go. So in 2010, we had a very, very colorful group of interns that um, we really enjoyed that year. So 2010 is two years after the Moose project started. And they took it upon themselves to animate the Moose workshop for us. And so there were several, there were several hand-drawn animations in the 2010 Moose workshop. If you're wondering why there is such a grim comic here, it's because our interns fixated on the fact that we had executioners at that point in time. So everything kind of took on this executioner theme. So you guys are going to learn a little bit more about what executioners are, but Anyway, that there were several of these kinds of pictures in that first presentation. What is Moose? Let's get the let's get the boring part out of the way. So, Moose is our modeling and simulation framework here at the laboratory. It helps us accelerate the deployment of high fidelity modeling and simulation tools. And wow, that is a bright screen. It's like I feel like I'm outside right now, but it's fantastic. Um, it's a it's a finite element uh, simulation platform. We lean into the multi-physics aspect. That's what we believe is one of our differentiating characteristics. It is a complete platform. So when you download Moose off the web, it's open source, which means that everybody has access to it. Lots of inclusivity, equity there. You get the whole thing. So you can build your simulations up from the ground. You can write the documentation you need to make your application successful. You have access to a full set of tools for building your test suites and so on. So it's a very rich package. It is massively parallel. You can run it on very large systems like Sawtooth over here, or you can run it on your laptops that you have sitting on your, uh, you know, in front of you all day. Um, and then it is very flexible. That's kind of the whole idea here is that we've built a framework that has dozens and dozens of ways for you to plug in your algorithms, your code, and to extend it and grow it to what you need it to be. So it's rare that we say you can't do something in Moose. It's more of how much time do you have and how much money do you have. But it's a very complete package. You can learn more about it at mooseframework.org here. So we do have a site. Please go there and find the latest and greatest. I want to jump 
to this slide as well. So this is a slide that appeared in a recent um, all managers meeting from our laboratory director to talk about the past and future of the Idaho National Laboratory. Yeah, welcome, come on in. Um, this is a really cool slide. Might be a little bit hard to read. There's quite a bit on here, but it's it's going through the history of some of the high impact things that happened at the laboratory. And notice this little guy here. I think this face, any of us that have been on the boost team for a while now, very proud that we can that we see our product up here on one of the most impactful technologies at the lab in the history. So that's that's really exciting. And then there's another slide that often comes up in the laboratory director's slide deck. So like the impact of moose based modeling and simulation tools. So I, I do want to really emphasize moose based. So I just talked about moose being the platform, but moose wouldn't matter if we didn't have the applications, right? So moose is there to enable all these applications. So on the right hand side of this slide, you see a dozen applications. We have many, many more, but there's at least a dozen of them that are very impactful here at the laboratory. And there are hundreds of researchers behind all of these at this point in time. So yes, Moose started some of these things in motion, but we wouldn't be where we're at without all the applications that are really pushing the bleeding edge of what we can do with modeling and simulation tools. So. A lot of cool stuff in here about numbers of citation, numbers of papers, numbers of visitors, but I think what really matters at the end of the day is that we are making an impactful product as a laboratory and as a very large group of researchers. So that's that's the takeaway from this slide. Along the bottom there, you can see people that are using it. We used to have a slide. And I was going to include one in here of all of the things that we do, um, all of the companies that we work with, but we've really whittled it down. These are the high impact ones. So these are the advanced reactor um, vendors. The US NRC is up there. They are using our products as well for the confirmatory analysis and some of the safety based analysis. Um, so yeah, our products are being used to help deploy the next generation of reactors. Really exciting. But how did we get there? Let's get let's take a look back. So this again, you'll see up in the corner, top corner of many of these slides. Um, when these slides first appeared. So here's a slide all the way back 14 years ago. Um, and this one's animated, so it makes it fun, but I just wanted to kind of take a look back at where we started. So here's a quick overview of my opinion of maybe some of the biggest, most impactful milestones. So 2008 is when the project started, okay? Um, Within that first year, within just a few months, Moose was actually already demonstrating multi-physics results to our DOE sponsors, which was really cool. Um, things moved very rapidly in the beginning. By 2013, we had full core multi-physics demonstrated at the MNC conference in Sun Valley. And that was thanks in part to the multi-apps capability in Moose that allows you to take various applications like you saw in the lab director slide and tie them together very easily without any code. And then you can run a multi-physics simulation. So the, again, we talk a lot of in the Moose training and in all of the Moose ecosystem about the ability to do this multi-physics coupling. So, um, and then there's the animation that goes along with that. 2013, 2014 was a very, very, those were probably some of the most impactful years. Uh, by 2014, we were moving, um, a lot of people were working hard to make Moose open source. And that was kind of a first of its kind here at the laboratory. We weren't doing open source software in the early 2010s. We just weren't this laboratory. So there was a there was a lot of roadblocks to tear down on convincing laboratory lawyers and IP people and export control that this was okay that this is the way that this product needed to go. This was gonna be the path to success. Um, and we we got there. So along with that, that immediately brought through a whole bunch of customers that would, we would have never have reached. We had international engagements that year. Several of us flew down to Australia and other parts of the world to actually work with people to use our products. And then we 
also applied for and received the R&D 100 award that year. So really exciting time. Um, it was a rapid growth in all of the researchers here at the laboratory in that same time period. So the applications like Bison and Griffin were rapidly growing and we were going through a lot of growing pains in our facility in Erub. So we started planning the GEM facility in 2015, which you guys all know now as the Collaborative Computing Center where you're sitting today. Say so it was first called GEM. 2017, um, kind of another big year because we really started to press on what we call moose wrapping, where we could take third party applications and we could actually bring them into the moose ecosystem in a very standardized way. And there were several applications that came out of it. Cardinal is on that list. Um, I didn't label it here, but Cardinal, the Cardinal team, the Cardinal project received an R&D 100 award this year. And that is a coupling between moose and NEC RS. So a high fidelity CFD code out of Argonne National Laboratory. 2018, Moose gets automatic differentiation. This was a game changer. This was the first time that people didn't have to struggle with doing math correctly for all of the derivative terms, like writing the Jacobian terms. So this was kind of a, a big change that had to proliferate all the way through Moose, where we had to kind of change our base level interfaces. But in the end, it's made our product more robust, arguably easier to use, and gives us a lot of properties we didn't have before that was available. 2021, Moose becomes the center of the NEMS program for non light water reactor applications. Okay, so NEMS is our DOE sponsor. They've been tossing money at us for a large part of the history of Moose, but now. Moose-based applications are the center of that program, and we still are today. And then 2023, I, li I list here that Moose has kind of made it to that list of political accomplishments at the laboratory that you see in the, in the lab director's slides. Hey, fun fact for you, Moose was not always Moose. So anybody who clones Moose from our GitHub site, they can run a quick couple of commands to look at like what happened in the very beginning. And if you run git log reverse, like you see on the very top of that slide, you see some of the first commits. Guess what? The first commit is not really the first commit. We, we slammed that in the migrated to git. So this, the first commit is really that second one there. Derek Gaston is the creator of Moose. He's here with us today. And you can see his first commit with its very helpful, um, you know, commit message, add Stroma. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Moose was actually named Stroma in the very beginning. Okay. Latin terms for framework, essentially. Okay. Um, our DOE sponsors came here and they watched us give a presentation. And instead of commenting all the physics, they basically said, you guys might want to reconsider those names. I used to have some of the earliest feedback we got. <laughs> it was renamed Moose after that. And that kind of goes down in history. Rob said Moose we've been working on for 15, 15 plus years. That's technically accurate. It will turn 16 this year. So Moose is now officially old enough to drive. It's scary when you think about that. So especially for some of us have been on it since the beginning. Um, according to the CDC, teenagers may also go through less conflict with parents. So I don't know what this means for Moose, but maybe we'll just have less problems with Moose from now on. More independence? I don't know. Spending less time with parents and more time with friends. I sometimes feel like that, but maybe that's just me and my manager role. Hey, this last one though gives me some hope. Maybe maybe Moose will be more diagnostic in the future. Give us more information about what it's doing and why it's not working. Or maybe we just add AI and it just does all that automatically. I don't know, but we'll we'll see how that goes. Big milestones for us. Um, this slide has no context at all, other than I just thought it was funny. But again, our, our interns in 2010, I, they were something else. Um, I, I don't know. These, If you don't like the jokes, please blame our 2010 interns. Hey, yeah, Brandon. Here? No. Unfortunately, none of them are still here, although I think at least one of them is in, in the Idaho Falls area as a school teacher. So, and she's proudly teaching STEM to students. So that's that's at least one success for us. 
Um, I do want to jump to this slide because at least back in 2010, we were doing some pretty cool animations. We were spending a lot of time on animations. We were trying to get DOE to recognize us as a as a player in this game. So what's what's Ice Storm? Who knows what Ice Storm is in here? Anybody know what Ice Storm is? Brandon does. Eric does, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so Ice Storm was the name of our supercomputer back in 2010. Okay. So of course we had instructions in our workshop on how to use Ice Storm, and you know again our interns thought that was hilarious and animated those slides. So anyway, this is. This is one of the movies that we produced from that um, slide, if we can play that. So what you'll see here is actually a full length um, rod that we ran with the Bison code, uh, fuels performance code. And I think we were, I don't know if we were into Star Wars at this time or something, but you'll see that we just basically make a run down this rod. This was a really impactful simulation. 2010, it was a really big run for the, the resources we had at the time, a full pellet stack, 300, raw, um, 300 pellets deep with full camphoring, dishing on the pellets. Um, this was a thermal mechanic simulation back there with cladding and everything. So, I mean, two years into the project, this is what we were doing. Um, I will say that this movie was incredibly difficult to build, not because of all of the keyframes and the flying around, but because the software we used it was so terrible, it would crash about every two to three minutes. I'm not exaggerating. So it was click a button, add a keyframe, save. Mm -hmm. Software would crash, reload it all up, do a couple more things, click a button, hit save, software would crash, reload it. And that was accepted somehow. That's what we did to build it. Crazy. I think I think everything has come further. <laughs> Did I mention that that we were really cool back in the day? <laughs> this, this is this is an actual view of the early Moose team. From so, um, I'm not sure if all this is PC or not, but this is this is the kind of stuff that was showing up in our things. By the way, those are 3D glasses. I don't know what happened to that era. I think back in 2010, 2011, everything was going to be 3D. TVs were going to be 3D. Movies were going to be 3D. Some of you may have seen Avatar in 3D. Um, I don't know what happened, but we bought a 3D TV, and everything we did had to be in 3D. So we were sitting around frequently wearing these really cool glasses. So we snapped a picture. <laughs> That's what happened there. Um, I do want to show you a couple of slides from again that same time frame 2011 2010 um, because it it shows again kind of like how little has changed so if you've watched moose presentations in the last couple of years you're going to see slides that look very familiar here oh and i by the way i did keep um <laughs> you may have seen that on the other slides but i did keep like this the inl branding templates at least for this presentation from that time period I really liked them. I thought they were really cool. So I don't, I kind of missed some of these, but this is a slide that appeared in numerous slide decks for a couple of years on explaining exactly what Moose was. I, I don't know what happened in the formatting, but somehow at one point in time that E carried over and it appeared that way in multiple, multiple slide decks. I thought it was hilarious. So I left it in there. What is this? What does this slide say here? Um, again, it kind of talks about Moose as a pluggable platform, yada, yada. We leverage lots of DOE code. And then there's this bold bullet down here at the bottom that says really one of our underlying goals here is to try to maximize the amount of science that we can do per dollar. That's something that is still a value to this day. And I think that's really what you get from Moose. For, for many years, we didn't have a big budget here. We really had to struggle against some of the other laboratories for their modeling and simulation money. And so, so we were getting a much smaller chunk of the pie here. We really had to, we really had to stretch to make this stuff work. So that was one of the early values of Moose. You'll see very similar slides in our slide decks today. Although I think the formatting might be a little bit better than what you see here. The next three slides, in my opinion, are really what are, are some of the key things that made Moose a success in the early days. From, 
from the very first commits in Moose. We had all of the things that make make um, software projects successful. We had a test suite. We had an issue management system. We managed metrics on what our source code was doing, and we had all of the automation to make that work. All from the very first com all from the very first commit. So here you'll see this is in GitHub, but some of our our earliest sites were in things like track and we were running nose back in Python and that kind of stuff. So here's here's a screenshot from our old track site. Um, I, I still think it looks pretty good to this day, but um, yeah, way back in 2011, we would we would frequently go to talks and say, hey, every commit in Moose is tested and we run all of our tests and we do it in 20 minutes. I'm sure I'm sure our CI guys love that now because we're <laughs> we're a little bit past 20 minutes. So um, and we have nearly a thousand tests. It's also really funny at this point. Uh, um, but the one thing that hasn't changed here on this slide is that we really did shoot for what we call high test coverage rate. So you see that here in this summary. This is this is actually generated from you know free open source tools, GCub and LCub. And this tells you like by directory, by file, or line by line in your code, which lines your test suite is hitting <laughs> and which ones are they're not. And so again, from the very early days of Moose, you could see that coverage was really important to us. And we put rules into our automated testing framework to say, hey, if you're committing large chunks of code and it's not tested, it's gonna fail. And that's something that we've kind of kept to this date. So you'll still see that in the way that we build our Moose-based applications today. Um, okay, a couple more slides for some hilarity here. So this is, here's 2011 where we were building um, we were building grain growth simulations. So this is the time that the Marmot code started. So Marmot is our lower length scale mesoscale code. And that team um, led by Dr. Mike Tonks at the time um, was doing a lot of these grain growth simulations. So this is like <clears throat> nanometer scale material behavior where you see like essentially each one of these blocks represents like lattices of atoms. And then the different blocks are misaligned with one another. And you put them under different loads of heat and pressure, and those microstructures evolve over time. Okay, it's a it's a really important phenomenon. Um, it helps us build constitutive laws that actually tell us what's going to happen with materials that are used in our engineering scale codes, like bison. Okay, what's funny about this? Um, this, this is a slide that appeared on our slide deck in 2011, where we were just trying to show like how scalable Moose was at the time. So, um, yeah, we can do a lot better, right? So, in the next simulation here that we proudly ran on the supercomputer at the time, we ran a 2D simulation on 8,000 processors to be proud of. I, I don't know if that's the right way to actually say it. Um, I will say that this particular simulation makes our lower length scale guiles cringe at this point in time, not only because of how inefficient it is, but just because of how bad the physics is. So um, the boundaries are way smeared out in this particular simulation. But what was really important here is how well Moose did perform under those loads. That's really what the point was. So um, each one of the dots in here is a separate variable that's defined over the whole domain. So it's mostly zero everywhere. And then like in one little tiny spot, it's not zero. So it's an inefficient use, inefficient use of the machine resources. But Moose doesn't care. Moose just eats that up. So um, this was just kind of a demonstration to show kind of how far you could push it. I will say that we did fix this problem, okay? So here's kind of like a very similar problem on not a square domain that we ran in the future with more grains, with fewer variables. And this was a workstation size problem, not a supercomputer problem. So if, if you were wondering, well, what did you do with it? We fixed it. Okay, so now we're getting into kind of the really high impact, high productivity time in Moose, 2013. 2012, 2013 is when things really started to take off. So from that point in time, you're gonna see a lot of people that do these Moose presentations, you see these coupling setup slides. Every time I see somebody's like 
tech report or journal publication with one of these, it really makes me smile because I think this is really where Moose shines. So earlier I kind of alluded to this multi-app system where you can take separate applications and you can tie them together and you can move data back and forth between them. This is kind of like your block diagram showing you exactly what you're doing there in a very high level way. So here, here's five different animals, five moose-based animals, and they're sharing data with one another. It's really cool. Now what's missing here is how all that works, what data is being shared, which order they're running in, but it doesn't really matter. For for if you're communicating with the general public or um, trying to explain like how complicated multi-physics is, this slide does accomplish some of that, right? Like we're running a whole bunch of, each one of these boxes on their own is, is there's tons going on in there. There's tons of multi-physics even within a box. But what happens when you tie them all together? So you get something really cool. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll credit, Derek Gaston with creating this system to meet a need. And that was to generally, I don't want to use the word compete, but basically kind of prove to DOE that, that the people at INL could do this too. Okay, There was a big program going on at the time, the CASEL program, consortium for the, for the advancement of light water reactors, advanced simulation light water reactors. So it was light water reactor sustainability program that really wanted to know if we could actually like look at really important problems at high burn up, high, you know, high degradation. So like what happens when we push these plants out to the 80 year mark, which is what we're trying to do. So we're like, well, we can tie everything together and we can kind of show you, we give you this predictive capability. So in 2013, we grabbed the AP 1000 public design documents. And by the way, this is, this is the reactor that's built at the Watts Bar unit in Georgia now. So that's kind of exciting. But in 2013, it was just designed. So we took those design documents and plugged it into Moose. We worked really closely with the Bison team, the Griffin team, the Relapse 7 team at the time to actually put this all together and actually build these really cool simulations. So this might be a step back in time for some of you on what we were doing here, but you can see rattlesnake, bison, moose, relap all working together to run a really long, long-term coupled simulation. So at the bottom here, you can see the advancement in terms of days. So, um, you know, moose can do these implicit time steps. We can step over large periods of time when the reactor is not doing a whole lot. And we can also take really small steps if there's some sort of accident scenario or transient going on as well. So um, I'm not going to get into all the details of what we're demonstrating here. That that blue dot in the middle there is actually where we put in fresh fuel. Yes, we know it's not realistic. It was just a demonstration calculation for any reactor people cringing at this moment. So there's that. And then here is the another simulation where we actually ran 40,000 2 DRZ bison rods um, and let them all go through their, you know, thermal mechanical behavior here to illustrate that moose can scale. Moose can run really big problems and you can do it all in parallel. The multi-app system that was built, what made all of this possible. So we showed this, we showed some of these results at the um, MNC conference in 2013. And I think it definitely created a little bit of a stir there that we were doing this kind of work. I don't think it was expected that INL was doing this caliber of work at that point in time. So that leads to the next thing. So we applied, the laboratory put the Moose team in for the R&D 100 award. Um, they sent us all to Las Vegas and we had a great dinner and meal and a lot of fun down there and got this award. So that was fun. 2014, open sourcing. It did bring a lot of business. It did bring a lot of collaboration and we got international engagement. So um, Derek and I and Rob up here actually flew down to Perth. You guys know where Perth is. It's on the west side of Australia. So it's a long way from here. And we spent a week down there collaborating with these team, this team of gentlemen here. Um, they went on to build multiple moose based applications. They went on to build multiple moose modules 
So it's been a very, very productive collaboration that still continues to this day. So they do a ton of geothermal work. They do mining. They do all kinds of really cool stuff down there. One of the most successful collaborations we've had in the Moose Project. Um, and if you don't know what this little creature is, you're totally missing out. So this is a quokka. Derek and I got to go see these guys. They only exist basically in one tiny little corner of the world right there next to Perth. And they are adorable. So if you ever get a chance to fly literally halfway around the world, definitely don't miss up that opportunity. This is one of my favorite slides. I don't know if it first started appearing in 2014 or maybe a little bit earlier, but we started, actually, I think this was 2014. I think, um, I think Andrew Slaughter on our team started producing this slide first, but Moose, the Moose ecosystem was growing very rapidly. And we had a lot of engagements at universities at this point in time. And every university was building a Moose-based application, which was exactly what we wanted. So to kind of illustrate that in a pictorial way, we put together this slide that appeared in our slide decks for probably at least four years with minor changes to it. But you can see that Moose sits here at the center. We have the modules. And for those of you who not who are not familiar with Moose, and I haven't even described it yet, Moose does come with a set of physics modules. It's part of the repository. And then you can turn those on to actually build um, very capable physics simulations with nothing but the open source software. So it doesn't take very much for a university student or a university professor or a university group to pick up the open source capabilities and then do practical research in that area. And that's why you see that fan there on the left. Everybody's doing that. Kind of everything on the right are a lot of the INL applications. So we have Bison there, which is arguably the most successful Moose-based application. Um, Yak, which doesn't exist anymore. That is actually our rattlesnake. That is our um, Neutronics application at this point. And then we still have Stork and Peacock there. So if you, again, kind of learning a little bit more about the Moose ecosystem. Stork is the script that you run that creates a new application. Because how do you actually start with Moose? Well, we've made it as easy as possible. Not only can you run a couple of quick commands on your Linux or Mac workstation to get the environment running, but then we make it easy to actually create a new application with this Stork script. And then Peacock is our original GUI from way back before 2014 that just helps you kind of see what's going on in a, in a visual way. By the way, to this date, we still don't have the perfect GUI for Moose. So if you want to build the perfect GUI for Moose, I encourage you to apply for the LDRD program because it appears in there. So have fun with that. Um, these slides start appearing in 2014. And looking back, I don't, I don't know if this was a good idea or not, because I look at this and I'm like, man, <laughs> what are you thinking here? Well, I think what we were doing with this slide is like, hey, there's a lot of really, really complicated stuff going on to keep all of these applications working and you don't need to worry about it and then move on. So the CI CD part of Moose is a reoccurring theme that has come up repeatedly. We are trying to maintain that huge list of applications and keep them all running at the same time. What goes into the CI piece is can't be understated. It's a ton of work. It's a ton of work to do it all. We do minimize how many times humans have to interact with this, but rest assured there are a lot of tests running in the background all the time. I'm gonna get the number wrong, but I wanna say that we're running in excess of 10 million, 15 million tests a week now for the Moose ecosystem. It's a huge number. <laughs> Now this slide, we can just sit back and watch it. So in all the way back in 2010, I think Derek started a Skunks Works project with one of our interns and asked him to use this wonderful product called Gorse, which lets you visualize the commits to your Git-based repository. And then it was so successful that we made this part of our workflow. And it was, it was uh, Jason's job, Jason Miller's, our technician's job, to find everybody's profile picture and attach it to the little pinhead that you get from Gorse 
so that we could keep this really important video going at all times. And we had this on our monitor for years inside the EROB pod. Every time you committed to Moose, we would turn around, we'd stare at the monitor for a while until like the movie would be rebuilt and then it would show up and be like, hey, that's mine. I just committed that. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think that was a huge distraction, but boy, it was a lot of fun. So if you were in EROB back in the 2013, 2014 days, I think you're more than a little familiar with this video, but um, the takeaway from this video is just the number of people that are involved in this project. Moose is such a huge project at this point in time. Um, I think this video goes on for like eight minutes, by the way, so I, we're not going to sit here for eight minutes. <laughs> I think I already said this, 2014 might have been the most impactful year in Moose. Not only did we migrate to get and make it open source and win the R&D 100 award and all those other things we mentioned, but there was a lot of real technical accomplishments going on. So this was a slide that was presented at the NEMS annual review meeting that year on just all of the things. So like we we added this checkpoint capability and we enhanced it and we had a new Python framework for the input file. We had a new output system. Um, we added this Picard iteration capability for the multi-apps. That's huge. That's still the thing that we use today. That allows us to do our tight coupling. Um, the CSIRO, that's the Australian collaborator that I all, that I already showed you. Um, vector post-processing system. We had the ability to actually look at images to generate initial conditions. Moose build. Didn't even talk about that, but Moose build was our CI system that we built to actually manage all of this stuff. We didn't use an off-the-shelf one. We tried, but we couldn't get anything um like jenkins or any of those products that were available at the time to do everything that we needed to do so we rolled our own and we still use it to this day it's been renamed to civet at this point in time but yeah it was a it was a big year which led to growing pain so here we are crammed in our cubicle um <clears throat> Whenever Derek showed up, he had to put up this yellow men working sign. No, just kidding. That's not. That's, um, but yeah, we had we were kind of cramped into this little space. We had a we had a table in the middle of our uh, our our section there. But um, as as the Moose team started to grow, we kind of started to feel, you know, the pressure there. So that that did lead to the campus and development or the campus planning and development team to start planning the facility. So here is like one of the first drawings that I could find of the gym facility. Um, looking at this now, I'm a little sad that this is not what we ended up with, but uh, so this, this was actually going to be, um, the gym facility was going to be what CyberCore and C3 are together. We were gonna do it all in one huge facility. So there's lab space, high base space, the, the computing side of the facility there on the lower left, that's actually a three, four facility. You can see the computer data center out there to the, you know, on, on the left side on the top there. And that parking lot looks incredible. I, I don't know what happened here, but this is what the, camp, uh, the campus planning guys came up with. Um, we still love our facility. This facility is awesome. I would not trade it in for anything, but it was, it was, eye-opening to go through this process. So there were a lot of people involved, um, Eric Whiting, Derek, many people were involved in helping plan the facility. And I think we could spend 10 minutes talking about all of the bathroom redesign, but we won't do that. 2018, um, big jump here. So I was talking to Derek yesterday, what, what happened? What happened in 2015, 2016, 2017? Well, Derek, went away, he was at MIT, so that was part of the problem. But I think 2013 and 2014 were so big and so successful that we, we really did just focus on maturity, cleaning up technical debt, making the product work, supporting Bison as Bison was growing. Um, they, they were a little bit leaner years. When Derek left, we didn't replace him necessarily. We hired, we hired Brian Alger to kind of work on Civit and those things, but we really didn't grow our team for a couple of years. It was a little bit thin. So didn't have a lot of really exciting, hugely impactful things that happened for a couple of years. But by 2018, um, 
we were kind of pushing again. We were starting to like really grow and, and push. And we started to sell Moose as the platform. So we had built our own documentation system. We had really grown the maturity of our test harness system and given it a consistent interface. And then we had rewritten Moose build in those years to this new Civet, which um, gave us a lot more robustness in the product. Civet is actually an open source product that people can download and use if they want to. I'm not sure if there's really a lot of interest in that, but it does exist as its own independent product. Peacock was massively rewritten as well as the um, build system in Moose. And we're still pretty proud of that build system. It's, it's pretty robust. So Moose platform. 2018, we start to see the maturity of several applications that we were advertising um, for the NEMS program in particular. Castle was starting to go away at this point. We could kind of see the writing on the wall that Castle was going away. So we're really putting forth our best foot in multiple areas to do all parts of the reactor all the way back in 2018. This picture here is really important because this is what really helped Moose grab hold of the NEMS program in a couple of years. So we were really setting the stage here in 2018. Still took us a couple more years of, of working with the program and the other laboratories, but um, at this point in time, the other laboratories have widely adopted Moose-based applications. I'm talking about Argonne, Oak Ridge, um, Los Alamos to a lesser extent. They're all using Moose-based applications at this point in time. And that's very exciting for the laboratory. 2018, wrapped application support. So um, we were starting to take third-party applications. So like NEC 5000, NEC 5000 is a, is a very nice um, high fidelity CFD code for doing eddy simulations. Um, and we, we coupled it with Bison so that we could do like more complex balls so we could see like the flow field past like a, a pebble bed type reactor where we might need that high fidelity. So we did that, that was, that was cool. And then we also built the interface that would later lead to some of the more, some of the bigger applications like Cardinal and Cardinal is a huge success today. Other exciting things, our facility was being built here. In 2019, this is what the Moose Cube looked like on the left. We had grown it and grown it and grown it. We just kept building the walls out and like sucking in more and more cubes and making it bigger and bigger. Uh, what's missing from this picture is we had a couch and lamps and it was it was quite the um, quite the area to be in. It was it was a really fun place, <laughs> but it didn't compare to what C3 is. So this is a photograph taken up on the second floor if you haven't been up there. Um, and then I think we were all really excited when we got to move in 2019, the fall of 2019, we packed up all of our stuff. We moved over here, moved in, all super happy with the facility. <laughs> then we got told to go home. <laughs> that was a real bummer. I will say that in 2020 and 2021, I think that ultimately some of the good things that happened with being home was just how much more effective we could realize we could be working across the country and working with other people. So even in 2020, we had remote workers. Boost team was one of the first teams that I'm aware of that had, I shouldn't say that. I think there's a few isolated pockets within the lab that had remote workers, but we had two people kind of, at least by mid 2020, we had two people working remotely. So Alexander Lindsay had moved to Seattle. That's an extremely valuable resource. And now the current Moose team lead and um, Roy Stogner, who is the LibMesh, who is the main LibMesh developer at this point, um, who we hired in 2020. They were both working remotely. When the rest of us were forced to go home, we learned how to work with those guys more effectively. And I, I remember Alex contacted me and he said, man, I love this COVID stuff because for the first time you guys are all talking to me now. So it's not just you guys sitting in your pod and I don't know what's going on because I'm not there, but now everybody's on Slack and on Teams all the time. We can actually talk to one another. In 2020, this is the slide that was a, 
Uh, I don't need all that popping up. This was the slide that we were starting to include um, as our moose modules continue to grow. Um, there's so much here and we were rapidly adding new things. So this was when our the ray tracing module was coming in um, as as part of Derek's dissertation, the THM module, which is kind of the reimagining of what what you need for um, systems analysis type codes. And then a lot of the Bison team was working on this paradynamics capability. So, and this this isn't even the complete set, I'll say that, but we were just starting to show this. So um, you download Moose, you get a lot with it. Twenty twenty one, we start to really mature in how Moose is used by external customers. So TMP technology management plan. This is a, a document, a white paper that came out of the NEMS program on hey, we we need to figure out how we're going to get export controlled applications in the hands of people across the country, including a lot of um, international staff and international uh, people. How are we going to do that? So in 2021, we we pioneered multiple ways here of actually how how to work on our systems at various levels of risk. So this was a big step forward. So we worked closely with the high performance computing team um, to come up with ways of using Sawtooth at that time to get on at that time as if Sawtooth is gone to get to get onto Sawtooth to run our applications. But we also created these really cool scripts that would let you log in and, and download codes that were built for you. So there was a lot of effort going into all of these technologies, Conda Mamba. Those are not moose based animals, by the way. These are um, Python technologies out on the web that allow you to do package distribution. We, we leveraged those to put our application into end users' hands. This next slide here was one of the ones that we showed at the team's annual review meeting. This is the complete set of commands that you must run once you have a Moose environment to get a hold of an export controlled application like Bison. It's that easy, it's four commands. Really cool. 2021, we revamped our, our fan slide into something like this. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this is better or worse, but this is what we've been using for a while, but it just kind of shows the layers of our applications. So we have all of our physics modules there in the green, and then we have all of these probably non-ADA compliant color schemes below that showing our various moose-based applications, and then our combined level applications tying everything together. The key here is that we're really starting to talk about how all of these tools can be leveraged to um, apply to all of the advanced reactor designs out there. So along the bottom here, you see all these cryptic names, high temperature gas reactor, fluoride high temperature reactor, um, micro reactors, molten salt reactors. So there's a lot of vendors out there building lots of different reactor designs with different fuels. Some of them liquid, some of them solid, all kinds of crazy things. And you can use the same set of animals to simulate all of them. Here's the evolution of that, of that animal slide I showed you a few minutes ago. So this started appearing in 2022. A couple of different names on here. Um, in particular, you'll see Mole up there and Sam and yellow jacket. So these are a couple of the moose-based applications that are not built at INL, but they're really critical to the success of the advanced reactor deployment. And so MOLA is an application built at Oak Ridge, SHAM is an application built at ANL, um, just to kind of show you a couple of these. But Moose owns the the NEMS program at this point in time. So that's a quick history quick as a 50 minute history of, of Moose. Now for the second part of this talk, I do wanna talk, um, this is a little bit more standard slides that, that you'll see if you come to a Moose talk today, whether it's Derek giving it or myself or somebody on the Moose team. 
Um, so if, if people get up and leave, I won't I won't feel slighted here at all. But um, I want to talk to the rest of you who may not be as familiar with Moose, just telling you a little bit more about it, how it works. So um, you can't talk about Moose now without talking about the DOE NEMS program. So NEMS stands for Nuclear Den Energy Advanced Modeling and Simulation, it's DOE NE, and it cross cuts several uh, nuclear energy labs. The NEMS program currently supports both light water and non light water reactor advanced designs. And the program is, is divided into several technical areas focusing on different aspects of those reactors. It is primary, primarily leveraging the Moose framework. So here's our laboratories, here's our technical areas that we all work in. Um, it's, a, it's a very important sponsor of our work. This is an updated version of the Moose physics slide. So it's getting larger and larger. A couple of the ones that didn't appear on there before, um, optimization. So we have uh, a way of doing the um, adjoint problems, reverse optimization for actually like figuring out, um, actually we have some of the experts I think here in this, in the, in the audience on doing the optimization problems. We have an entire system, a module in Moose that does nothing but builds reactor meshes at this point. So these images on the right hand side here can be fully constructed with nothing but input file blocks. No qubit needed, no GMB needed, no meshing software needed. We can build these things programmatically in input files. So that's a huge capability. That, that work has primarily been done at Argonne National Laboratory, but we've had a lot of um, a lot of people at INL helping with those efforts as well. The stochastic tools module, I think it was on the 2022 slide, but it's also here. This is a capability that allows us to do all sorts of really cool things like run anywhere from tens to maybe millions of moose based simulations within a moose based simulation to do all sorts of things, do uncertainty, to do statistical analysis. Um, to do adjoint problems, all of that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a really cool capability. There's also some machine learning capabilities built into the stochastic tools module. So you can do things like build reduced order models and, and actually have the machine learning piece help you decide what are the most important um, parameters to tweak and those kinds of things and just do it autonomously. Um, Recently, the heat conduction module that's been in there since day one got a facelift. It's now called the heat transfer module. So that's something else to point out on this slide and, and several others. So you get a very rich capability with Moose today. So going into the Moose stochastics modules, I always forget that this slide's here, but you can see all of the things that you can do. Bayesian uncertainty quantification, um, surrogate modeling, reduced order modeling. Lots of really cool things. Again, another slight variation of that same animal slide that I've shown like three times in a row now. Here's kind of what we're showing today. Shows kind of the core toolkit for advanced reactors. So even though NEMS does light water reactors, most of the work here at INL is focused on the advanced reactor piece with some small exceptions, mostly in the bison teams. Um, but we have our core toolkit over there, and then we have our primary customers over here. And, and many of these customers are working with us in a CRADA um, situation. So they're giving us money or we're getting money from DOE to actually enable the successful modeling of many of the um, reactors that are being built at these various vendors. Arguably, maybe the most important customer on this page is the USNRC. They are using our Blue Crab application, which allows them to do to use the same set of tools to actually perform the safety analysis and the confirmatory analysis on their side of things. Some people wonder, can we use the same tools at vendors and the USNRC? The NRC says, yes, we can. They have different goals. They have different models. They don't share their models with the industry, so they have different things that they look at, but the answer is yes. As long as the tools work, they could be the same tools. 
The Blue Crab capability is also capable of doing light water reactor analysis because it does also wrap NRC tools in it. So that's another cool thing about Blue Crab. Okay, so I alluded to this multi-app transfer system is one of the biggest accomplishments in the 2013 timeframe, the MNC conference, all of those cool videos I showed. We like to briefly highlight it here because it is one of the biggest differentiating factors for why you should use Moose. Why should you use Moose? Why shouldn't I go get ComSol? Why shouldn't I use ANSYS? Here's one of those reasons right here. So we have the capability of, of setting up this hierarchical structure to run a really complex multi-physics problem. Um, and basically your imagination is the limit here. So we have done this several times, this picture where we have several levels of multi-apps tied together. And then generally we communicate information along the lines that you see there. However, we can communicate information now to sibling applications as well. So that's a capability you don't see on this, but um, essentially you can, Tie together a whole bunch of simulations without writing any code. Perform a very complex multi-physics analysis. So how do we use that in practice? Well, just taking one of the advanced design reactors, such as the molten salt reactor, if we want to do something like design basis accident, we can pull in a couple of codes like Griffin, Pronghorn, and Sam. So Griffin is our reactor transport code. Pronghorn is our force mesh. Um, fluid code or CFD code. And then SAM is our systems analysis module out of Argonne. So these are the these are the kind of codes that you might need to operate to do a design basis accident. So these are the codes that NRC would be interested in running in this combination. Okay, but maybe a vendor wants more information in there. They actually want to calculate some chemistry or isotope information. So let's take that same design basis trio that we just had and, and tack on one more code. And that just means a couple more lines in the input file. And now you can do this more complicated isotope, isotope transport problem. Okay. If you want to do salt property evaluation, again, you can just swap out mole for the phase field, which phase field is our lower length scale capability. And we can do uncertainty if we plug in basically stochastic tools in any of these combinations. So these go on and on. Correlation development. So here's where you're running a really high fidelity code. Um, and the high fidelity codes are expensive. So typically you'll run them to get some information to build some um, you know, algebraic model or some other model. And then you'll use that correlation or that constitutive model inside of one of our other codes. Okay. So we can do all of those things. Same slide again. This is in our current slide deck. I already talked through this one once. This one's here because it has cool pictures. Okay, So here's some TRISO compact modeling um, where we actually want to look at a whole bunch of fuel pebbles. And yes, we can model these um, at various fidelities. Frequently, we'll model the TRISO particles as 1D lines but we do have the capability of modeling them in three dimensions if we want to. It just becomes a more expensive calculation. So, um, and we could do a lot of them. In this case, this these images, we're doing 4,000 TRISO particles. So at the very least, that's still 4,000 instances in a multi-app of running a calculation to produce temperature fields, conductivity fields, stress fields, all of that kind of information so that we can actually try to get really close to what the flow would be through a gas reactor. We're really interested in those quantities, okay, at different levels of fidelity. The next several slides here are use cases for, again, what codes that you want to do, kind of the various models that we're building today um, for the various advanced reactors. So SFR is our sodium fast reactor. Um, and so we have these hexagonal things. So we have to do um, thermal mechanics simulations. We have to tie in Griffin for, for the neutron transport. And then there are various models that we run. So our VTR reactor, which hopefully we get to build someday here at the INL, we have that, we have that modeled and that's available. We also have the ABTR reactor, which is a model that is used heavily by the NRC. 
and these models are benchmark models. So anybody that comes in, like say Westinghouse with a sodium fast reactor, they can model these things. High temperature gas reactors, these are cool. So um, we don't have any of these in the USA, but there are a couple that are built elsewhere in the world like China, but we have advanced, we have um, a couple of vendors that are trying to build these reactors now. So we can tie together, um, you know, Griffin, Moose, and some of our CFD codes to actually model these. This particular result that you see on the top right was actually done by an intern under Dr. Lee Charlot's um, mentorship two years ago now. Um, and so like, yeah, interns can come in, get a good mentor, and then before they leave in the summertime, they are frequently able to run real models, do real analysis, um, even like start the publication process for journal articles or conference articles. So that's getting to be like a normal project for many of our interns at this point in time. Okay, so here we are, fluoride high temperature reactors, um, kind of more SAM modeling that you see over there on the left. If you haven't seen systems analysis, it's these piping networks where you're really interested in like balance of plants. So you're, you're sticking so much energy in and you're moving the materials around, flowing them at certain rates. You need to keep track of, you need to make sure that you're conserving all the quantities of interest, mass momentum and energy. So that SAM code does that, but we can couple SAM to any of the higher fidelity codes to build a very real plant model for any of these plants. And then molten salt, these are always really fun too. So um, there's a couple of benchmark problems here, the molten salt reactor experiment at Oak Ridge. Um, we're doing some molten salt work here at the laboratory that's very critical for the path for some of these ADR or excuse me, ADRP reactor. Um, but we're, we're doing a lot of molten salt work as well. Um, the flow side, and we're also getting more and more into the chemistry side as well. Microreactors, these are really important. BWXT, Westinghouse, they're both actively building these microreactors. They come in two flavors. The promise of microreactors, if you're a little less familiar, is that they're small, easy to construct, typically at factories, and then shipped to location and then they can operate um, and supply a steady load for a you know for a need that might be somewhat remote so they're they're being looked at heavily by the military they're being looked at for communities that are served um, you know like hard to reach communities like think remote parts of alaska or even you know even parts of the the west here where things are spread out micro reactors um, look like a really good power source. So they, they generally come in two flavors, gas cooled and also these heat pipe designs. And we're able to model both. We have a, an entire code devoted to doing the heat pipe physics. Okay, so actually like sending energy or heat energy along a um, uh, technology to transport that heat. So all of these models, where do they end up? Well, luckily, our friends at NREC, the National Reactive Innovation Center, they are storing all of these models in the virtual test bed. So this is a publicly available repository of moose, mostly moose-based applications. We have, I think, at least 30 models out there. Many of them are benchmark problems, um, but some of them are, are kind of just like representative problems. So we take any of those reactors that I just showed, we build models using several Moose-based tools, and then we openly publish the input files for those models. And also a lot of information about how the model is constructed, and that's all available on the VTB. So this is a, a very cryptic slide right now that shows you the layout of the VTB repo. At this point in me rambling on, you can probably get an idea of what that top line is. That's all of the names of the various reactor technology types. And then further underneath that, we have the benchmarks. And then you can see like the code names that are used in several of those benchmarks and the models that are being developed. I think this slide is about a year old now. I don't know if it's been receiving a lot of updates, but I can tell you for sure that the VTB 
has grown beyond this slide at this point. So we're, we're getting to the point where we can't even represent models pictorially anymore um, on a single slide. There is a lot going on here. Um, NEMS is heavily supporting this effort. NRIC is also supporting these efforts. Boost does more than fission, okay? Fusion is becoming a really important technology. Again, still, I don't know what the right word is to use there. Um, but we, we're involved in, in, this, in this area as well. So a couple of years ago, we made a moose space version of a, of a uh, popular tritium transport called TMAP-8. So we have that capability. Um, there's an entire department maybe a couple of departments that are doing advanced material research now. Um, the thing about fusion is the material side of that is just extremely complex. So we're doing a lot of material modeling there. This is a collaboration with, again, this, the same um, nuclear energy laboratories, but we're also working really closely with um, the UK Atomic Energy. Maybe I'm not saying that right. The UK AEA. It's the 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 nuclear entity in the UK, they're very, very interested in doing fusion modeling. And frankly, they are ahead. They have at least five or six moose-based applications that they've been building for at least three, maybe four years more at this point to do a lot of the different fusion physics of what some of these reactors will look like. We have done some of this work here. Um, We've done some LDRDs on this work, and we're rapidly growing the capabilities in this area. So fusion, Moose is, is well on its way to being useful for fusion energy as well. And then we can't leave uh, the discussion without talking about all of the geothermal work. So um, we have the FORGE program that supports some of this effort. This is you know kind of a follow-on to a lot of the efforts that have been done at CSIRO for the last decade now. But the geothermal, the geothermal portfolio for Moose is starting to grow fairly rapidly at this point. And if anybody's interested about this aspect, I highly encourage you to talk to Rob Bergorni. He's the right person if you're interested in this area. So we are working with Chevron. We are working with other private companies in this area. So Moose is ready for a lot of these problems too. What lies ahead? Where are we going with Moose? I don't know if you guys figure it out, let me know. Um, these, are, these are a couple of bullets that popped into my head. We are working with a commercial company that's very interested in doing what's called isogeometric analysis. So these are kind of like more exotic um, ways of representing your problem. So typically with finite element or finite volume, we use somewhat elementary functions in our in our finite elements to represent uh, our physics. And those elementary, those elementary functions um, sometimes require a lot of degrees of freedom, especially if you have very complex physics or really complex geometries. Isogeometric analysis is an attempt to reduce some of those complexities in some ways. In reality, it's a trade-off. There are some things that get to be a little bit more difficult with ISO geometric analysis, but there is some very promising, um, there are some promising methods that come out of that. We won a technology commercialization fund award in this last year to work with Corform LLC out of Utah to increase the capabilities in Moose for IGA, isogeometric, isogeometric analysis. So that's coming. We have a big chunk of money to support that for the next two years. Roy Stogner is the lead on that project and he'll be doing a lot of that work. Accelerator support. I've been talking about this forever. Accelerators are hard. Boost has purposely steered clear of them for a long time because multi-physics on accelerators is hard. Um, there are programs out there. MFEM is one of them. And we are working really hard with DOE and some of our sponsors in Washington, try to see how we can 
learn from MFAM and leverage some of those technologies so that maybe pieces of Moose can be accelerated more than they can today. Some of the new technologies where you have coherent memory between um, GPUs and CPUs look a little bit more promising than past technologies where the memory wasn't coherent and you had to move data, which zeroed out a lot of the accelerator um, advantages if you couldn't keep all your memory in one place or the other, all your data in one place or the other. I think we're at the point where we are looking at accelerators more and more. We want a GUI. At this point in time, Moose is a mature platform for doing advanced reactor um, modeling and simulation. Advanced reactor multi-physics modeling and simulation. One of the things that's lacking is a good GUI. We do have really great tools for helping with editors, input file tab completion, input file validation. Moose now supports the Microsoft language server protocol. What we don't have is the perfect GUI. I don't even know if it can exist, but this is something of interest. The current LDRD call has a section in there focusing on trying to make this happen. I hope there's something that comes out of that. More commercialization. I think there's a lot of opportunities to take our codes and work with commercial vendors. Now, at the laboratory, we're kind of focusing in the other direction. We're trying to make our codes more open source. But these two are not mutually exclusive. You can have an open source product that leads to a lot of commercialization. And in fact, I would argue that that is maybe the best path to commercialization. Okay, so we are trying to make many of the applications that you've seen here today more and more open so that we can compete on a world stage with these advanced tools. And then that will likely bring more customers that want to build small businesses to do consulting or to take some of our tools, tie them together, and then offer a service on top of them to do some more commercialization. And that's frankly something that we should be supporting as a laboratory. So I, I do see both of these things more and more in our future. Um, but it's, it's hard to see where it will go from there. And those are just some of the things that I see that kind of lie ahead. And with that, with that, that concludes, and I don't even have the fancy um, end slide on there. So sorry about that, but thank you everyone. Happy to take questions. Yes, Brandon. Yeah, you talked a lot about you know the history, which is really cool. Um, if you could go back and change any major thing with what you've learned 16 years later, what would you change? You know, I. It's funny, I don't have an answer to that. I actually feel really good about the path that we took to get there. I know that we struggled along the way with getting DOE support. I don't know what we could have done differently to get that. That was an uphill battle from the beginning. Um, in, 20, in 2014, we had auditors knocking on our door. They wanted to know um, what we were doing to be NQA1 compliant. And those first couple of audits were really rough. So when the pain banking there, we were doing the right things. What was lacking in 2014 was the documentation that we were doing all the right things. But to this day, Moose has actually pushed forward what NQA1 is doing in their part of the program. Moose is actually impacting NQA1 standards at this point in time. Because what was there even just a few years, years ago in the software quality things is there was really no, um, there was no like automated workflow way to get work done without lots and lots of paperwork. What we showed with Moose and the CI system and the documentation system and all of the things that we've really put a lot of thought into is that you can build software without a paper trail. Yeah, you need a lot of electronic records to do that, but computers are really good about making electronic records and storing them forever. So yeah, we can use computers to do that. So I, I don't know, I don't really have a good idea, but I would like to, 
you know, give Derek maybe an opportunity to answer that question. Maybe he has some different thoughts. <laughs> and I put him on the stage. Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't think I would change anything. I, I think like Cody said, straight from the beginning, we had in mind that this was going to grow and get big and have lots of users. And so straight from the beginning, we had really good development practices and a really high software quality practices. And we put together a software design that has withstood the test of time as far as being modular and flexible and extensible and all the good things. And 16 years on, I mean, it's still it's still developed the same way it was 16 years ago. And so I, I think we were doing the, the right things in the beginning and we kept doing them really well. So I, I don't really think I'd change anything. Thanks. Good question. Anyone else? Any online? I don't know if we have any online. I can't see the, in the chat. Okay. Chat right now. Well, I appreciate all you coming. Oh, I will. Oh, there's one in the chat. Oh, there's one. Okay, um, say I don't need to perform simulations, but could use the Jacobian or optimization tools you guys have developed over the years. Are those types of things easy to access, incorporate into user's code? Um, that's a good question. I think it kind of depends on exactly which pieces that you're trying to use. I will say that um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if things will be easy or not. Um, we have little things that kind of make their way through the entire framework, like the definition of things like real or, you know, like mathematical vector types and, and matrix types that we kind of pull all the way up from like Petsy and LibMesh into Moose. And people tend to use those in their codes. I think if you try to just pull out a directory, a set of directories from Moose, there would be a little bit of work to try to like separate it from the rest of the five. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't do it. You did. You get to download all of the source, and if you look at Moose, especially if you look in this last week, the main program that you have calls into this thing that kind of runs like a really prescribed um, setup and then execution of the program. If you have the full source, you're in control. You can do whatever you want. So if you just want to use our utilities, that's actually really easy to do. If you want to use like core systems in Moose, it's a little bit trickier, but you can still like utilize the whole setup of Moose and then maybe just turn on specific utilities. So I think you can get the job done. I would recommend that you reach out to our teams, talk to our optimization people, talk to talk to me and I'll get you in contact with the right people. And I guess kind of like more generically, if anybody has follow on questions that they want to ask me in the future, please come see me. Come see Eric, come see Rob. We're happy to answer your questions. We love talking about this stuff. Come see Derek. Derek is now our, our representation in, in Washington. So definitely go see Derek. Another question came online, Cody. Yeah. Is, is Moose use a matrix-free funded element method? Moose does. However, you can also build matrices too. So there's different aspects. We have different ways of solving the problem at this point. Um, most of those capabilities can be dialed up right from the input file. So if you want to do like say full Newton solves, that's generally our recommended way, unless you have massive, massive systems where those matrices get too large to build and store. But yeah, honestly, we started with the matrix free approach way back in 2008 and stuck with it for many, many years. It's still a very good method. You have to be very careful about your derivatives and your Jacobian and getting the right terms in there for preconditioning and emergence. But yes, we can solve it that way or we can solve it with the matrix. But I'm going to stop the questions here um, and help close and present Cody with the C3 Super Cube. That weighs about eight pounds, so don't cool. drop it on your foot and don't hit anybody with it. It'd be a murder button. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate and it. And like, one final moment before we close is the one of the comic strip that Cody didn't show is the one I can see all the time. It had these three little frames. And then a developer came from the back. I know. Sack phrase or TTOF. And it's like, you know what that means? It's like, it's small and bigger and bigger. But they just sit there for me. You know what that means? I'm not going to say it here. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Give me another round of applause for Cody. Thank you.
Okay. So let's next month the topic we port So we'll see you then. Thank you. Uh,